it's my great pleasure to uh, invite to for for a fireside chat the professor Angela Brandt. Angela, thank you so much for being with us today. Marius, and congratulations to the sixth conference and a pleasure again uh, discussing with you, like always. Angela Brand is full professor at uh, Merit, Maastricht Economic and Social Research Institute on Innovation and Technology, Maastricht University in Netherlands, as well as director of European Center for Public Health Genomics, as well as uh, chair on public health genomics and adjunct professor of the School of Life Sciences in Manipal University in India. Actually, uh, Angela is connected from from India now with uh, with us. Uh, Angela is uh, has been the pioneer of the public health genomics in in Europe, and uh, has coordinated and established the national task for task forces in more than fifteen EU member states within the last years. Uh, I'm, as I mentioned, I, I'm very happy to, to have you with us today, uh, Angela. The uh, topic of our discussion is public health renaissance. And uh, I have to say that I have been inspired by the discussion you, you had uh, at the Digital Health Society Summit. Uh, like a similar format where you said that uh, actually we... Uh, we uh, face now the public health renaissance, but we'll discuss about this a little bit uh, later. But let's start with uh, with the fourth industrial revolution and uh, with the biologic revolution. And uh, what are, in your views, what are the major uh, development in this area of, uh, of technology in the last uh, 15 to 20 years with a clear impact on uh, on uh, on the health and care, on public health, and so on. Yeah, that is, uh, thank you, uh, Marius, really, also for the nice introduction. And uh, yeah, it's really about what are the innovations, right, in public health. Yeah. And uh, I think we often talk only about the technological, but they are also the social innovations. And I understand always they have to go hand in hand. Uh, so not, not any single, I would say, technology will in the end be really successful if it doesn't become also social innovation and you are also i could say um, a representative of both sides uh, uh, really and um, so when it comes to the social innovation in public health um, I, I i observed and see really for the last years more and more growing and maybe it started in public health with a, a rare disease uh, um, a community that people want to be um, more involved in decision making, they want to be um, in the driver's seat, uh, they want to control their health data and um, I think this is really a very, very good uh, movement and we need uh, new models, new good governance model for this to allow this, this bottom-up approach like uh, health data cooperatives. So that I would say is for me the major social innovation and the technological innovations. When I look back public health, um, um, I think the first uh, really uh, came massively through genomics, the whole omics field, and this is uh, uh, still arising so much. And uh, then a little bit later, um, by the move of big data and uh, artificial intelligence and then into, of course, machine learning, deep learning, etc. And um, so this as uh, more enablers, um, I would say. But in public health, so the milestone for me when it comes to milestone, or I would say biggest evolution, is for me epigenomics. The epigenomics field, so combining the knowledge of social science, biological sciences, the marriage of these two disciplines, and um, where we now understand more and more uh, how social factors, including environmental factors, uh, uh, behavioral, all the whole spectrum are on daily basis, on individual basis, um, changing our genomes. Uh, that's a highly dynamic process and that helps us to understand diseases now. And um, so I think this is really, really a big, big, big uh, step and uh, where um, we have to, whether individual is really in the, in the focus. And 
um, when discussing that with public health people in the beginning, it paved, by the way, also very much the personalized medicine way. Yeah, And when we discussed in the beginning, and uh, I remember that we both had on a panel also, uh, Mario, at that time, when people said, this is not public health. No, it's not true. Over 100 years ago, even Winslow said, we have population-based strategies, we have stratified, and the individual ones. So now we are there. And um, you mentioned our um, uh, public health genomics uh, network, and I think that was um, where we started 25 years ago, 25 years ago. So, uh, uh, and now it's mainstream, but the, uh, in the beginning there was a lot of skepticism from human genetics, but also especially from the public health community. And now it's mainstream, like I said. Um, but what I personally learned is public health is a, the progress is a snake and we cannot, we cannot proceed in that way. We need to be much faster and because our task is um, to uh, always to say, are we doing the right things, right? Yeah, and then in a timely manner, and we can't lose uh, 20 years to get things implemented. Yes, indeed, you, you mentioned the public health genomics being mainstream now, and uh, we see some countries moving to the, uh, in this area of genomic surveillance for SARS-CoV-2, like Denmark, like United Kingdom, a very good example in South Africa and Botswana in Africa in general. I think it's a very good example for all of us what is happening in terms of genomic surveillance in, in, uh, in Africa as well in India, a lot of developments. But uh, uh, we can see some inequalities, we can see different approaches uh, between uh, the regions, the continents, the countries, um, despite the fact that actually the pandemic requires for the health authorities to monitor you know, all the activities of the healthcare facilities, hospitals, primary care doctors, and, and so on. And uh, what this situation has changed for health monitoring? Because we have uh, this pandemic, a big public health uh, threat, a lot of technologies, a lot of knowledge for 25 years, a lot of experts. Yeah, when, when I look back, the uh, start of the, um, um, when the pandemic started ne, and uh, surveillance uh, of data, uh, we had always, for example, in the news, at least I'm originally from Germany, but living in the Netherlands now, always Johns Hopkins. And I was questioning myself, <coughs> why does the European countries not also have data available? And uh, like you said, surveillance and monitoring has been always a key task of public health, including the surveillance of infectious diseases. We have also even centers, European Center for Disease Control, etc., but also on national level. And um, so I think the underlying in the, the uh, with the pandemics, um, the underlying uh, concepts um, or methods, they, they didn't change at all. But with the digital tools now, applying to that, we are much faster, much quicker, um, better prediction, better analysis, analysis, real world evidence we can create, yeah, and uh, make um, predictions under high uncertainty, uh, high risk. So uh, this is really something um, um, uh, which we learned. And um, um, especially also what we learned, we had already talking about the syndromic surveillance, so moving from the surveillance of diseases to um, uh, the a bunch of symptoms, uh, symptoms ending in a syndrome, so syndromic surveillance, and that has been pushed, for example, what had been early early signs of COVID, yeah, it's certain um, um, uh, symptoms and mainly loose of um, taste or smell or, or this kind of things. And um, uh, so that was really pushed. But I think what the next step is, and we started already, is to include also individual genomic um, information into this, individual information, so underlying pathways, patterns. And that under, um, explains already why uh, people have different severities 
of COVID, um, why um, also fatality rates are different, why drugs treatments, uh, vaccinations, um, uh, the re responses are different. And this is not only between continents, but also, of course, between individuals, between continents. I learned here, for example, recently that in Asian countries, there are more um, the lung symptoms in, 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 in um, 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 how to say, um, uh, the, the, the syndrome um, factors, whereas, for example, in Europe, it's more heart um, uh, failure. So this is quite interesting, and it has to do with uh, population genomics. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very uh, it's very important what you what you mentioned because we are currently focused on uh, genomic surveillance of the virus virus sequencing mm -hmm. a lot of uh, a lot of. Um, uh, viruses across the globe. We we are able to to understand the variants. We are able as well to to predict or to have an anticipations on what could be the next mutation of the virus and the implication uh, on for for a certain uh, for a certain individual. Now with the syndromic surveillance, you added actually the clinical part and we will develop in the second part of this session. How important is the role of the family doctors, of the clinicians in general to to, to understand and to, to, to share the data? But you also added the uh, omics data, genomics data of the individual as part of this big picture of and um, part of this, uh, I think, um, major objective that we should have to be able to identify at the individual le level the risk for severe COVID-19. Because I think this is actually what is more important now to be able to identify, uh, despite the vaccination st status maybe, what is the uh, uh, state of an individual in order to, uh, to have a, a, a mild or a severe COVID-19 disease. And, uh, you know, for all of this to be, uh, to be a reality, we need a lot of uh, technologies in place. We mm -hmm. should be able to use these, uh, these technologies. We should be able to generate and to analyze and to share data. And this is my next my next uh, next uh, question and topic for our discussion about the digital transformation. Digital transformation is a part of the fourth industrial revolution. We we can see a lot of uh, transformation outside the healthcare, but it's very interesting to to find your views on what actually digital transformation means for health and care, for public health, for us as individuals. Yeah, I, first I have to say, I, I really like the topic <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you choose and you, you are always so innovative, visionary there, Marius, and uh, this next to, to, to cross boundaries between uh, physical biology and digital. Uh, and I think um, um, what it means for health, I think still people um, um, don't differentiate between digitation and digitalization no? and digitation just uh, going from analog to uh, digital so to um, uh, just um, the format of of uh, of the data uh, so putting putting data or information in the digital form which is of course a major step and uh, local health departments are not here that we just discussed it um, the other days and <clears throat> Um, uh, but then, so to make it uh, computer readable, but then the transformation really I, is, a, is, a, is a challenge and uh, uh, making sense of the data um, and using it for, for a real world prediction again um, and decisions. So, um, yeah, I think what we really can say, it's a new reality. It is there. It is not somewhere. It is here in our daily lives. And is, I always say it's just an enabler tool. We will learn to deal with that. Um, and um, uh, Eric Topper from Scripps in La Jolla Institute, um, I, I think he's really one of the visionaries ne, in, in, in home medicine, field health sector. And um, he always says it implies radical transparency, radical. And then on the other hand, I observe in many countries in Europe how we are obsessed from the concepts of privacy, of, uh, of uh, 
um, a data security, but how people and especially young people react is really totally different. For them, it is really part of daily, daily life. And um, then I see that there are also different digital solutions in different um, um, uh, countries. And I guess this has, of course, there's a cultural background, no question, but there's also trust in governments and in leaderships. And um, I've been several times in Taiwan and they are used to digitalization for a long time. They have trust at the same time in the government that they deal with these technologies in a good way. And so I think this is, they had been one of the very first putting uh, 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 um, uh, pharmaceutical data combined with health technology in a cloud system years ago. So um, I think this is also the why they did so well in the pandemics. And then I look at Europe and I think their people don't trust. I mean, there are differences in Nordic countries. There are obviously is a, a huge difference um, um, Estonia and uh, Finland, yeah, where uh, in, in Estonia there is not a single administration a process or process is analog, it's all digital. <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, when I look, for example, at the European um, um, general, um, a general uh, data protection regulation in place, it is so interesting to see how different member states interpret it. I think it's a good one. It, 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 uh, there is a lot of room, like I said, for interpretation, but what is lacking is give a mom can in a broad way, in, in a narrowed way. And I think what is missing is to, um, to give member states a little bit of guidance in terms of what could be um, best practices. No? And uh, when I then uh, look at the European health data space, Big concept and elephant in the room, but I, I, I really think it's fantastic also initiative. Again, it leaves a lot of room for interpretation. Yeah. Um, and there I can see France in the moment as a best practice offering. And France, um, they are, did a lot of, put a lot of national investment into digitalization and now um, a French a data lake a kind of call it um, providing data access for all. So to the citizen, to the insurances, to the hospitals, to public health services, and uh, where also everybody is part of this cake uh, has a saying, it's a very much bottom up approach. And they, this, this is combined with centrally set rules and frameworks. So I think this is really a nice, um, model there's even for example a generic concept for uh, public health which i liked uh, especially so i would like i hope that when the new presidency eu presidency starts in france um, this will have an influence on europe on the interpretation and um, i mean it over 20 events they have already on that topic digitalization so that's good and then on the other hand yeah, what should I say? There is really another step backwards going on. What I would say is a data governance act, which is proposed, um, the legislative proposal of the European Commission, where it was a good intention yeah, to have a framework, to have easier access to data, but I fear it will be exactly the opposite. And so many rules, over 100 already, and top down, and uh, yeah, more, more regulation. And I think this is not what citizens really want. So we have this whole <laughs> spectrum, I would say, what we see, and we have to find a way. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And we, I think we have some, some opportunities. You mentioned the France presidency of the EU Council starting January with a lot of events and initiatives around uh, digitalization. And thank you so much for making the, uh, the differentiation between digitization and digitalization. We are usually discussing about digitization, saying that is digitalization, at least in our country. It's a confusion and we should be able to differentiate and to move actually to digitalization. And as well, what's very important because you mentioned, I think, I think three times the word trust. And uh, mm -hmm. I think it's a key word, especially in the, uh, in the pandemic, 
because the trust of the population in the government, in politicians, in health system, in medical doctors, and so on, actually influence the behavior of the individual when it comes to wearing a mask or uh, uh, accepting the, uh, to, uh, the the vaccine, the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. And uh, in this regard, I would like to, to move to the uh, public health renaissance uh, topic. And I think the trust um, should be somehow in the center of the of the renaissance. And I, I, I my, observation here is exactly that this is why we have this heterogeneous landscape, no? what we saw. And um, when um, now I'm a little bit provocative, um, when, uh, when I looked at the media and the communication, risk communication around that uh, topic, um, uh, COVID, I didn't see public health um, um, uh, public health professionals trained in policy advice in the media. No, it had been virologist or it had been epidemiologist and I have to say sometimes unfortunately I'm now a little bit uh, bad uh, second league and they um, <laughs> yeah and um, um, uh, they meant it in a good way but uh, um, uh, policy advice is something different also ne? and they took over um, and uh, people got lost having all these different opinions in the media. They really got lost. And I think this also created a loss of trust. And um, so um, uh, on the other hand, uh, what is positive, uh, I think um, what I saw with public health uh, renaissance is we have this nice approach of health inner policies. By the way, this was also pushed by another president, the digitalization was by Estonian, and this was by Finland years, years ago, and I think this is such a smart approach. It, um, where health is in all policies, it's never explicit, maybe, in a policy, but it's everywhere in, it's implicit, so whether it's safety, whether it's environment, whether it's trade, uh, so um, it's, it's really good. And I think this um, uh, had a push um, during the pandemic. A renaissance that made me uh, really happy i have to say because we forgot uh, a lot of times especially on local level about it however then it was a, a little bit disappointed that some other sectors they explicitly tried to exclude health like for example the economic uh, sector because i mean for good reasons yeah they didn't want to risk the economy uh, they didn't want to risk growth or uh, uh, travel restriction jobs etc so um, that is understandable and um, renaissance i would say also it is because public health was always a, um, a little sister or little brother of medicine medicine but public health <laughs> it's different, in, yeah, and um, so that was the hour uh, or the time for public health now. And uh, for example, in Germany, the former Chancellor Angela Merkel, she put it to her own on her own agenda and in initiated a pact for public health. And um, now it's going on. It created a window of opportunity to rethink public health. And in the moment, there is a discussion in Germany again, for example, um, about a new institute of public health, where I am a little bit skeptical. I don't think this is the right way, but uh, to, um, um, to, uh, to have more visionaries in public health visible and that they have a voice. And um, also, this is a little bit sounds negative. Um, we public health professionals alone would have not been able to manage this crisis. Um, and uh, although we claim always we are um, transdisciplinary, so even crossing sectors, but in the end we are in our silos. This is very critical. Um, uh, and maybe not very, not, um, not, <laughs> not so fair because in the end everybody, every stakeholder had to learn. It was a learning by doing this crisis. We never had it before in such, never um, Spanish flu, but uh, yeah. yeah, but uh, 
in our recent uh, history. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Actually, we we didn't have experts in pandemic because the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Spanish flu pandemic was 100 years ago. So. Uh, is was learning by by doing as you mentioned, and the little brother actually grew the public health, and now is mainstream. And I fully agree that we need public health visionaries uh, like you, like yourself, able to you know to put together all these concepts and uh, new technologies and uh, uh, new ideas, genomic surveillance of the uh, of the microbes and syndromic surveillance and all the omics developments, human omics, let's say like that. Uh, and uh, you, you're totally right when you, you spoke about the virologists and the epi epidemiologists and some clinicians who were actually on the front of communication and uh, very few uh, well-trained, um, policy-trained and risk communication trained uh, specialists be uh, coming on the on the television and the radio and uh, trying to to explain to the population what is uh, uh, all about exactly and i think uh, and i will quote uh, uh, here um, francis collins who actually said that uh, the pandemic will end but infodemia will stay with us for uh, for long uh, now so um, we should uh, as public health specialist visioners maybe uh, we should be able to address uh, this and you mentioned the behavior how important it is uh, the individual behavior and the population attitudes and perception in relation with uh, with uh, with the health with innovation with the digital transformation and and uh, and so on we are uh, running slightly out of, of time so i have one uh, final um, challenge for you what would be the future of uh, or in europe in the european union after the pandemic there mm. are a lot of discussion a pandemic treaty uh, the a new role for european center for disease control what are your thoughts on this yeah, um, uh, first, I, so I'm a little, um, li little bit skeptical whether we are really prepared for such an event again. Yeah, because some, the learning curve of some countries was very steep, the other was very low. Uh, for example, now I'm, it's beyond uh, Europe, but um, in India I saw that the second uh, uh, crisis hit India a lot. But the government immediate coordination uh, action. Many people are now uh, vaccinated, and uh, um, um, they, they they really showed leadership. In Europe, it's different. I would say we are we have the European strategy, but in the end, it's the member states again. Yeah. So um, um, uh, Israel was always transparent. We continue. I think Gibraltar is a small country, but they. Um, uh, vaccinated everybody that didn't have a single case uh, of uh, uh, deaths of COVID anymore. Portugal, Portugal, there, um, there is a former admiral in charge of the management. Yeah, so I think um, um, a retired uh, and, uh, admiral and uh, uh, having this uh, really expertise in a good management, uh, so they could uh, do well. When I look Aust Aust Austria, Netherlands, Germany, that is a very sad picture, very sad picture. And even today uh, in the news in Germany, yesterday, people in, e in uh, one um, uh, city in East Germany, they went on the streets to to again protest against um, uh, the, the vaccination. So two times more people on the streets and the new chancellor, Olaf Scholz says, well, please, I really ask you to stop this. And there we have, uh, um, I'm, um, I don't think an, an, a European concept can help, but a strong leadership. This, this, this we have to do, and that is missing. A European strong leadership, a globe like a Churchill. I always say, <laughs> and I agree with um, um, Francis Collins. I, I guess my, and I'm not the only one, predict that maybe in half a year um, we will have it under control. We will live with it, and with Omic um, uh, Omicron already, when a, a, a variant needs thirty mutations, weapons uh, to, uh, to, to uh, survive uh, in the host, um, then it gets really um, 
uh, weaker and weaker. And also then um, I think what is good uh, European wise to think about vaccination, booster vaccination, think about procurement, what we have, these rules we have you know, for countries like um, they cannot afford or now the new vaccine uh, from Pfizer. Uh, 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 Paxlovid, where I really think this is good, but there we need strong, strong, um, strong European initiatives, um, uh, guidance, uh, and again, I, I would say uh, procurement um, is, is, is really a good uh, instrument. You yeah, mentioned, I, yeah, you mentioned the uh, the need for for a strong leadership at the political level and decision makers level. Indeed, what uh, pandemic show us is, is, is how how important is the or are the political determinants of health? And I think it's a to it's a it's a, a topic we should explore in the years to to come. How important are politicians when dealing with this type of uh, public health crisis? On the other side, yes, mm -hmm. yes, Angela. Um, um, uh, yeah, I. Uh, what I um, last point because we you, you said we are really running out of time. I, I think the G7. I'm impressed what they initiate. Um, G7, G20. Um, it's not about COVID, not only, but AMR. That also just this week, uh, well, 13th of December, they put in a lot of efforts, financial effort, um, efforts against an, um, antimicrobial uh, resistance, for example. So it is possible, but maybe um, uh, we have to think of Europe in the global context and what other players are there also, and not only European Commission. Yeah. And yeah. uh, so I can see there really a strong leadership, maybe from the G7, G20. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, on the professional side, I think we have a very good leadership and uh, your uh, presence here, I think it's a very good proof of uh, that we can count on health professional like yeah, like you, like uh, many people from from your teams, from Netherlands, from from India, to 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 be able to uh, you know to 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 live and to act and to work uh, in the public health renaissance uh, era, actually, because it's just the beginning. And this uh, you you mentioned that this public pub, that public health it's a task actually for everybody, and it's our task to to build uh, the new reality for public health. As you mentioned, not just being focused on Europe on or on the European Commission, but at the global global scale. Angela Brand, thank you so much. A pleasure, like uh, like always. Thank you so much for being with us today. A lot of uh, great ideas and, and inspiration coming from our fireside chat. Thanks a lot, Marius, for giving me the chance. And uh, thanks, a uh, thanks a lot again. You are really one of the leaders in that. And uh, pleasure always discussing with you. Thanks a lot, Marius. Thank you so much and, uh, and all the best. 